This is my uh, research video project for George Herbert. And the structure of my video will be as follows. Number one, the overview of George Herbert's life. Number two, overview of his works. And number three, I'll be talking specifically about three different pieces of literature within uh, his, his work, The Temple. Number one, Redemption. Number two, The Sinner. And number three, Peace. And uh, lastly, I'll conclude <coughs> with talking about how Logos, Pathos, Ethos, and Kairos relate back to George Herbert and just some general thoughts on how his work relates to today. Number one, an overview of George Herbert's life. George Herbert was born at Montgomery Castle on April 3rd, 1593. At the age of 12, he was sent to Westminster School, where he studied Latin, Greek, and music. His musical skill was concentrated in playing the lute. Because of Herbert's background of music and skill of being a musician, he was able to master the skill of lyrical verse. After Westminster, he attended Trinity College in Cambridge. At the age of 23, he was made a fellow, or what I assume to be a member, of Trinity College and taught undergraduates in Greek grammar, rhetoric, and rules of oratory. He suffered from poor health and a lot of doctor's bills, which cost him a lot of money. Because of his low financing and need for many books, he wanted a position of dignity that would improve his situation and was appointed the public orat orator of the university. As a fellow of the college, he was expected to take holy orders in the Church of England within seven years of his appointment or resign from his position as public orator of the university. He was a devout Anglican and a opponent of the Puritans and Calvinists. However, he was much more in tune with the world of court and government. He violently attacked the Puritans, specifically Andrew Melville, in the form of Latin thesis. He became a priest at the age of 31. Herbert gave his friend Nicholas Farrar a little beginning, his manuscript collection of verse, The Temple, which Farrar published the same year as Herbert's death. Herbert then died of consumption on March 3, 1633, for the last years of his life, he was a rector of the parish of Bemerton in Wiltshire. Number two, overview of George Herbert's works. George Herbert's notable works were The Temple, The Country Parson, and Jackie Love Prudentum. The Temple was produced by experiments with rhyme patterns and stanza forms. There are 15 sonnets scattered through the manuscript there are there are many many more poems within the temple um, John H. Odenhoff just focused on 15 sonnets for this critical essay that he wrote each show great vitality wide variety a balanced exploitation of the freedoms of a strict verse form and the freedom he had in religion although Herbert's sonnets are all grouped together within the temple they are not treated as a group Herbert uses many variations of the Shakespearean rhyme scheme within his sonnets. He utilizes the meter of iambic pentameter in his sonnets. Now for number three, I will talk specifically about redemption. Having been tenant long to a rich lord, not thriving, I resolved to be bold and make a suit unto him to forward a new small rented lease and cancel the old. In heaven at his manor I am sought. They told me there that he was lately gone, about some land which he had dearly bought, long since on earth, to take possession. I straight returned, and knowing his great birth, saw him accordingly in great resorts, in cities, theaters, gardens, parks, and courts. At length I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. There I him espied, who straight your suit is granted, said and died. The narrative sonnet redemption is a parable, sermon, and personal testimony all at once. This particular sonnet has a very biblical pattern as well as an Elizabethan tone with the modification of rhyme scheme in the third quatrain. Herbert compares himself to a tenant and God as a rich landlord. He 
he links these two terms together with the third set of terms. Old Testament covenant of works and New Testament covenant of grace. The poem moves in a direction of a profound fusion of the two terms, tenant and lord, landlord. <clears throat> Dr. Luis Marcos says the sonnet, once read all the way through, represents mankind's search for God, mankind's problems since the fall at the beginning of time, and the sin of man looking for God in all the wrong places in vain. The last lines of the sonnet refer to Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the penalty of all of mankind's sins washed away by his sacrifice. This act ties the title of redemption back in with the meaning and progression of the poem. Mankind's redemption was fulfilled on the cross by Jesus Christ, and therefore George Herbert's redemption as tenant was also fulfilled. Now we'll be talking about the sinner. Scripture depicts the actions of a retributive God against sinners, resulting in a broken and contrite heart. The pieces or stones of which are to be restored. While the sins of the speaker, arrogance and greed, or pride and being unappreciative, are being punished, his remorse of tears changed the punishment to destruction. Albert C. Labriola says, his compliance to have his heart restored in the shape of an altar sacrifices the sinful desires that bring out retaliation as the speaker engages in reparation as an introduction to holiness. The speaker begs, And though my hard heart scarce to thee can groan, remember that thou once didst write in stone. Old and New Testament verses define these images. These verses say that God will take away hardened hearts and give us new hearts of flesh, that God will write the new law on the earthly tablets of the earth, and that the temple of the Lord with Christ as the foundation is alive within the stone or the heart of man. Another biblical reference, like the altar, is the flogging of Christ, who is seated while haters who stand nearby taunt and ridicule him. The third biblical reference to which the altar implies is the burial of Christ. Pentecost is the fourth reference like the altar. For the coming down of the Holy Spirit in the middle of the apostles is often interpreted as the effect of the new law on living stones, the hearts of the apostles. Now I'll be talking about peace. Peace starts in the present with the pilgrim, who is the speaker, talking about a sweet peace, the place he has not discovered. Throughout the pilgrim's trek, his attitude seems to become increasingly more aware of only himself and nothing else. The word I appears 12 times in 21 lines. Assuming that peace lives set apart from the rest of the world as an archive of obscure knowledge, the pilgrim starts at a secret cave. The pilgrim asks if peace is present, and a hollow wind answers with a no. The pilgrim stumbles upon a rainbow next, and an empty sky which is commonly known as a metaphor for insight and a metaphor for absence, where clouds disperse the vibrant colors of the rainbow. Lastly, the pilgrim enters a garden. With an interested mind, the pilgrim begins tampering with the flower's root, not thinking about the possibility that he is putting the flower in danger. He finds that a worm is eating what showed so well. The pilgrim shows no trace of understanding beyond the physical of each finding. We are left to figure out who the figure is in the images of the root and the worm. The pilgrim's attitude shows growing impatience and rage. The pilgrim then meets an old man whom he demands peace from. Resistant to the pilgrim's rage, the old man replies with a story about a prince of old at Salem, alluding to the Hebrew king of Melchizedek, and who is known as King of Salem or King of Peace. The book of Hebrews also explains that this mysterious figure is without parents and is like an Old Testament Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Now here are my concluding thoughts on George Herbert and his works. George Herbert's works are certainly timeless pieces of literature. Each piece of poetry strikes at the heart of man and exposes our vanity, our sin, and our wickedness as humans. However, he also creates each poem with another common theme, redemption. 
hope, peace, prayer, all relating to his faith. He shows people that they do not have to live in their old lives. They can find redemption, peace, hope, prayer in Jesus Christ. George Herbert wrote about Jesus in the 16th and 17th century, and Jesus is still relevant to this day. George Herbert was a firm advocate for his faith and for the Lord, and his words of poetry still strike a tune in modern times.